You ready for the word? Here's what we're going to share about this morning. So I'm going to start with you, and then you tell somebody else. Here it is. Here it is. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Turn around and look at somebody. Say, Merry Christmas. How many of you would believe with me that there are many people that say Merry Christmas and they don't have a Merry Christmas? How many of you think that's true? You know, they don't get the gift that they like and they're not happy with the people they're around and family issues sometimes uh, will destroy a Merry Christmas. And sometimes the very fact that we're struggling in different areas and if, if, if we're not happy, sometimes we can't have a Merry Christmas. Am I right? How I many of you believe there are people uh, that their attitude and their surroundings all affect whether they have a Merry Christmas or not? Okay. How many of you would like to have a secret? A secret. I can't tell everybody, but, but you're special, so I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how to have a Merry Christmas. How many of you would like to know a few secrets so you can share with somebody how to have a Merry Christmas? You see, a Merry Christmas will come when we have the real meaning of Christmas. Anybody listening to me this morning? I said when we really understand the real reason of Christmas, we'll have a Merry Christmas. Turn with me the gospel according to Luke in chapter 2. We're going to use some scripture this morning. Is that Okay. Our message theme, how to have a merry Christmas, how to make your Christmas merry, how to make your Christmas full of joy. How well, I many of you know merry means not necessarily uh, the mother of Jesus, Mary, but how I many of you know it means a joyful time, gladness in your heart, happy is the man, amen? Happy is the man uh, that uh, walks in the, in the integrity of the Lord, happy is the man. Uh, that knows how to draw from the well of God, that flows the anointing of God. Amen? So Luke chapter 2 with me in verse 8, looking at some scriptures. And now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Uh, we know these scriptures. We hear them every Christmas. In fact, we read them over and over again. But how many of you know if it's the word of God, we can't get it too much? So don't, uh, don't fade on me as I read scriptures that you've already read many, many times, even from childhood. Amen? Uh, but I believe God has a revelation for us this morning, so you don't want to miss even one word. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord showed around about them, and they were greatly afraid. Get the message. Get the story. Get the picture. Then the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for, be, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, uh, which will be to all the people. Verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. Somebody say Savior. Amen. Who is Christ the Lord. Amen. And this will be a sign to you, and you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, now, at that particular moment, the angels all came out in full force. Can you see that? There was a band of angels coming out to do what? To praise God and magnify the Lord and to be able to sing praises. And here's what they said. Glory to God in the highest and on the earth peace, goodwill towards men. Are you with me? So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. These are important words, and we're going to key in on a few of them this morning. So as you're reading this with me, if there's a highlight, something that sticks in you, put a little line under it because we're going to hit on some of these things that, uh, that I believe will make an impact. Now let us now go to Bethlehem, see these things which have come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Verse 16. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby laying in a manger. And now when they had seen him, they made, uh, they made widely known and saying which was made to them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at these things which were told to them by the shepherd. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherd returned, 
glorifying and praising God and all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Praise God for the reading of his word. Amen. God's word is strong and mighty and powerful. God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word, when you read it, it'll always bring a change in your life. God's word will never return void. Hallelujah. Uh, whether you read it once, whether it's the first time that you've read a scripture, whether you've read it a hundred times over and over again, if you allow the Spirit of the Lord to give revelation in your spirit, man, it will allow you uh, to see things that you didn't see before. I read the word. When I read the word, I say, Lord, give me revelation. Give me insight. Are you with me? There are certain... Uh, 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 there are certain Christmases that you can remember distinctly because of where you were. If you'll stop and think of some Christmases uh, that uh, you were in certain places, sometimes the memory's not as good as other times. But sometimes if you'll think about where you were in a certain given place, it'll bring a, a remembrance of Christmas to your thought patterns. Are you with me? In fact, I'm going to give you a moment to meditate. To think of a Christmas that you can vividly remember in your mind. Something that stands out. Something that took place. And you can remember. I can remember in 1961, in December 15th. Uh, before then, the 1st of December, I was stationed in, in uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey in December. And I got orders to come to Tampa, Florida and be here on the 15th of December. And, and at that particular time, I was close enough. I could go back and forth to my family. I could, I could go home by driving over the mountain in Pennsylvania. And all of a sudden, at Christmas time, I got orders to come to a special operations group called Strike Command, a station down here in Tampa, Florida at McDill. You might think that's exciting, but it wasn't at that exciting 10 days from Christmas. Is anybody with me? I vividly remember that my whole outfit at, at, at Fort Dix had gone to uh, Germany. The whole, my whole outfit that I was trained with had gone to Germany. Three of us, a guy named John Hawthorne, another guy named Matt Matthews, and myself, and we were sent down here to McDill in a special operations group, and we came, uh, they flew us down here, and we came to the old airport. I don't know if anybody remembers the old airport over off of over off of West Shore, uh, when the airport was little, it was a little small airport in, in Tampa here, kind of the way uh, Clearwater St. Pete Airport is today. And we flew in, didn't know anybody, didn't have any friends or anything, and here we are in a place we've, we didn't know, nobody that we knew, the three of us on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day just hanging out, feeling sorry for each other. <laughs> All alone, by ourselves, not knowing anybody. I... Uh, I had just turned 18. I went in the Army and I was 17. And my buddies were all young like me. I was the youngest guy in my outfit. And we were grieving the fact we didn't have family. We didn't know anybody. Nobody cared for us. And I can remember that vividly as a lonely Christmas. Anybody ever have any lonely Christmases? I'm not trying to bring any bad memories up, but I'm trying to say that sometimes we need certain Christmases uh, that you can remember distinctly because of where you were. I was in Tampa, Florida. My whole family, all of my friends, everybody I knew was in Pennsylvania, and I'm down here by myself, uh, basically by myself, not knowing anybody, hanging out at the, uh, in a brand-new outfit out at McDill waiting for Christmas to pass by. So we could get involved in the, in the work that we had to do. I remember, I remember that distinctly where I was in December 15, 1961. Then there was a certain Christmas that you can remember uh, because of what you received. Can anybody remember a Christmas that you received something that's significant? Anybody remember that? Kind of think around something, maybe a special gift that you got or something that took place special and, and something uh, that you received. There are certain Christmases uh, that you can remember because of what you received. Are you with me? I have a, a memory of receiving something. It wasn't a good memory, uh, but it's something that sticks out in my mind when I think about receiving. I remember this was a good memory. I remember as a little boy, I wanted an axe for Christmas. You see, I lived on a farm, 
and my job was to go down and, 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 and cut little trees down and, and clear land. And, and as a little boy, I, 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 we uh, would do most everything by hand. We would plow by, uh, with a horse, and we would plow with a hand plow. And, and so I wanted a little axe, a little axe. Well, we didn't have any money back in the 50s, and I knew that probably wouldn't happen, uh, but that's what I wanted. And it was a special event to me to remember uh, that as a little farm boy in a farm of Pennsylvania, uh, somehow or another, my mom and dad figured out how to get that little axe for Christmas. And at Christmas time, under the Christmas tree, I saw the little axe that I uh, saw in the, in the Sears catalog. <laughs> and oh my goodness, you talk about a thrill. I remember it to today. It, that, that little axe that I had, and boy, I went and chopped everything down. I was cooking and booking. I was chopping things down he wasn't supposed to chop down. <laughs> My dad had to take me aside and tell me that, you know, give me some axe instructions. But I remember like it was yesterday, and that little axe, what a surprise it was. What a joy it was to look under the tree and see that little axe that I saw only pictures of in the Sears catalog. How many of you can remember something that you received like that? Maybe you have to go back to your childhood, but there was something that stands out in your mind that you received. Why? Because something that sticks out in your mind at Christmas. Uh, not only uh, do we need to remember where we were, not only remember do what we received at Christmas time, uh, but also certain Christmases you can remember vividly uh, because uh, they were surrounded with a unique thing. Uh, not always good circumstances, but a unique thing that took place at Christmas. Think about it for a moment. What's unique? What happened in your life? Something good or bad, but it was unique. To me, I can remember 1962, the first Christmas after my son John had, had died from being stillborn full term. He was, he was born a few months before Christmas, and the grieving, we were still dealing with the grieving process. We were dealing with the loss of my son. Someone at the funeral, as we had a funeral service for my son, said to me, and this was an encouragement to me, he said to me that my baby was so beautiful that God wanted a baby in heaven, and he took mine to be with him. And that gave me the comfort for the moment. Got to remember, I was just an 18-year-old uh, young man and uh, just had a, uh, my first baby. We lost the baby. And then I was reminded when Christmas came that God, Son, left heaven and came to the earth to be with us that we might have everlasting life. That's a reminder of Christmas. Then I remember also on October 30th, 1966, God blessed me with one of the greatest gifts that I can remember. My daughter Beverly was born in October 30th, and it was just a month before or, or a half a month before Christmas. And I tell you, my beautiful daughter Beverly was born, and I was just awestruck. I thought, I thought and still think today one of the greatest things ever happened in my life. It was that Christmas that that little baby girl filled the house with love and joy. It was that Christmas uh, that, uh, that it seems like giving gifts to each other and the, the glitter of the Christmas tree and all the Christmas things uh, didn't have the, quite the excitement to me because I had a little girl uh, that I loved with all my heart that God had gave me after losing a son. Now to have a healthy little girl that was so strong and vibrant and close to my heart was a Christmas that I'll never forget. Amen? The Christmas season comes upon so quickly, doesn't it? Some of you young folks, you think it takes a long time to get there. Just wait a little bit. I don't know about some of you, but the older I get, it seems like the faster the years go by. I mean, like, you know, they've got turbos in them or something. And, you know, nitro. Nitro is, is kicking us from one Christmas to the other. It seems like it's moving quickly. Has anybody notice how quickly it seems like the years go by? It seems, to be, it seems to me like very quickly. And if we're not careful, we can forget the real reason why we have a Merry Christmas. 
See, Merry Christmas is not necessarily over gifts. It's not necessarily over the things that we can remember that took place in the natural. But when we look at the theme, how to have a Merry Christmas, I'm going to give you a few reasons for the next few moments how to have a Merry Christmas. First, we must remember the main reason for Christmas. Anybody hear me? We must remember the main reason. We must remember the main part. We must remember what Christmas is all about. Luke chapter 1. I looked at some of these scriptures uh, uh, Thursday night. We did a teaching on Elizabeth and, and, and on Zechariah and how God anointed them to, uh, to bring John the Baptist into the world and, and, and he would be the forerunner of the coming of the Lord. Are you with me? Luke chapter 1 and verse 8. Luke chapter 1 and verse 8. So it was that while he was serving as priest, talking about Zechariah, before God in the order of a division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside. And Brother Anson uh, ministered on this this morning uh, using the fact uh, that people were praying. And he brought out the fact that angels of the Lord were present. And so we need to recognize when God does something, he has order. Amen? God has an order to what he's doing, and there was order in what was happening. And verse 10 says, And the whole multitude of people were praying outside as at the hour of incense. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call him John. Amen? And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And we know that that took place. Amen. We know that that was a reality. That happened. And then we, uh, we realized the anointing and the presence of God came. And, and the angels uh, were gathered. And the Spirit of the Lord uh, intervened and spoke. And God moved mightily in that situation. Hallelujah. Merry Christmas begins with a baby in the manger. Merry Christmas doesn't begin with gifts under a tree. Merry Christmas doesn't begin with lights and decorations around our house or even a Christmas tree. And let me, let me say this. I love the lights. I love Christmas tree lights. I think they're beautiful. I love the Christmas tree all decorated. I love the packages under the tree. Some, how many of you really enjoy that and appreciate it? And, and please understand, I would never say there's anything wrong with that except as long as those things don't take preeminence away from the real meaning of Christmas, which is Jesus came into the world to die for the sins of the world that you and I can be redeemed. Amen. The most unlikely place to find Merry Christmas for some is in the life of a baby. But I want you to know Jesus wasn't an ordinary baby. Jesus was born of a virgin, conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit, an impartation of the Holy Ghost, planted into her that she might bring forth the Son of the living God. Jesus left heaven and came to earth and humbled himself uh, to become uh, not just the Son of God, but to become the Son of Man, that he might reign and rule and he might die for me and for you. He wasn't an ordinary baby. Anybody with me? Luke chapter 2 and verse 11. For unto you is born in this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. One that would redeem the world. One that would come and save us. One that would uh, would cleanse us from our sins. One that would give us hope. Hallelujah. For the hope that we have in him. The baby was born to die. The baby was born to save us. This baby was an anointed one. His name was Jesus Christ, the anointed one. 
This baby is Lord of all, King of kings and Lord of lords. This baby came to rule and to reign. This wasn't an ordinary birth. This wasn't something that we just pass through Christmas and take it lightly. This is something that we need to be awestruck and we say, oh, Lord, what you've done for me. Oh, God, every time we have an opportunity to celebrate anything that Jesus has done, we ought to celebrate it with our whole heart and recognizing the ultimate price that was paid. A celebration like this cannot be found in the mall. A celebration like this can't be found at a Christmas party. A celebration like this uh, can't be found under a Christmas tree. Is anybody with me? The main focus of Christmas must be sought carefully and diligently because he was found in a lowly stable in Bethlehem. He wasn't in the Hyatt. He wasn't in the big motels or the big fancy places uh, where many of the rich people would gather, but he was in a stable in fact, there wasn't even any room for him in the end. Is anybody with me? He was Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he came to pay the price. So first we must remember the main part. We must keep the main thing, the main thing. How many of you think there's something lacking in our society today and when it comes to the important things of Jesus, the main things, not the main thing? Even in Christianum, it's been overtaken in some cases by many of the other sidelines and the glitter and all the things that people like to do and they bring it into the church because after all, it's convenient and after all, it pleases everybody and people run to that. But let me tell you what's important. We need to keep the main thing the main thing, church. Then the second thing I would like to make mention of if we're going to have a Merry Christmas, the second is we need to get someone else to help you celebrate. How many of you know, how many of you know it's not fun to celebrate something by yourself? I'm a fisherman. I love to go out and catch a fish. I enjoy going out catching a big fish. And some people don't mind going out catching a little fish, but I like to go out and catch a big fish. But there's nothing worse than going out and catching a big fish and nobody's in the boat with you. You're all excited. You're pumped. You got to make a decision. Am I going to take this thing home and show it? Or am I going to be a nice, uh, a nice guy to listen to all the bill dance and all the big fishermen and they say how good it is for fishermen to catch and release? So am I going to release this big fish? I can take a picture of it, but you know, that's just not the same. How many of you with me? And see, there's something about having somebody with you to enjoy uh, the presence of your joy. Amen? Yeah, when, whenever something great is happening, you like to have somebody with you to celebrate, to celebrate the good things. Amen? And so, uh, you, you know, I, I think you all heard the story about the golfer and the, the pastor that was going to slip away on Sunday and, and go play golf. And, 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 and he didn't want the congregation to know. He didn't want anybody uh, to know about it. And, and he slipped out. He was with his friends. And he started at the very first hole. And when he hit that, uh, when he hit that uh, uh, ball at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the hit the tee, the ball went out. And it went out and went all the way across and right into He had a hole in one. Oh, he was excited. He was jumping up and down. And his friends, you know, were there. And they said, can't you wait till you get home and tell everybody? <laughs> he wasn't supposed to be there. He wasn't supposed to be there on Sunday. His congregation did not, did not supposed to know. So here he had this great victory, but he couldn't tell anybody about it. That's a sad thing, don't you think? You see, we need to have someone else. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 17 it says, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the sayings which was told them concerning this child. Whenever something is exciting in our, in, in our life, we need to share it with somebody. We need to be able to rejoice with somebody. We need to have somebody, and, and, and even the angels of the Lord went and rejoiced when they, uh, when they saw the star and they, and they had the revelation. They had to go see the, they, they had to go, go fulfill uh, what God has called them to do, but they had to share it with somebody. No time of the year is more productive than sharing the gospel at Christmas time. 
I think Christmas is the greatest time to win souls of the kingdom. I think Christmas is a time when people's hearts are softened and ready to hear the gospel message. The whole reason for the season is found in the birth of Christ. At Christmas time, Jesus came to, uh, to, to uh, fulfill his, his obedience to the Father and die for you and I that he might be the ultimate sacrifice. And the world is waiting for the good news. It is the good news of the kingdom. Amen. The shepherds increased their joy by spreading the good news of Jesus' birth. Joy comes in your heart when you can tell somebody else the goodness of God. When the Lord blesses you, you know the first thing you want to do? You want to tell somebody that you've been blessed. Amen? I want to tell somebody, I want to tell somebody what Jesus means to me. And I think it's important at Christmas time, if we're going to have a merry Christmas, that we have to be so open to share the good news with anybody that you might know. A family member during a family gathering, in the restaurant when you go to, uh, to have something to eat, in the grocery store, there's always somebody that needs to hear the good news, especially at Christmas time because people's hearts are softened. Someone complained one time to me about Christmas uh, not actually being uh, the, the day that, that, that Jesus was born. Someone else uh, figured it all out that, uh, that it shouldn't be in, in December. It ought to be some other uh, time of the year. I said, listen, if the whole world wants to set aside and recognize the birth of my king, I don't care what day they want to make it. If they're going to sing Christmas songs in all the malls and all the restaurants and, 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 it's, and, and, and people don't even realize what they're hearing, but they're hearing the gospel message in song, I say, let them go for it. I'll sing with them, praise God. I'll go in the mall and praise the King of kings and Lord of lords. I'll sing my Christmas carols to those that want to hear it. You know why? Because we have no idea the impact that this makes in someone's life as they're walking by even thinking that they don't need, need God. Amen? Keeping Christmas to ourselves will rob us from the greatest opportunity we have to discover true joy and to have a real Merry Christmas. If we're going to have a Merry Christmas, we've got to share this gospel with somebody. If we're really going to have a Merry Christmas, we have to be open enough to say, this joy is so big in me that it's welling over me. I have to tell somebody. I have to let this good news out. I can't keep it to myself. They couldn't keep it to themselves. They had to tell somebody. They had to let somebody know. Amen? So we need to understand, first of all, if we're going to follow or if we're going to have a Merry Christmas, let's, let's make the main thing the main thing. Can I hear an amen? amen. The second thing, we need to have others that we can, with like mind and, one, and like spirit that we can celebrate the good news with. We need to share the good news with our family. We need to share the good news with those that we might know, we might work with, we might have acquaintances with. Everybody has a sphere of influence. Everybody has a certain amount of people that will listen to you. Am I right? Everybody has a certain little group that they'll pay attention to you, that they honor you, that they'll hear what you're saying. Listen, speak the power of God in the life of Jesus this Christmas into the hearts of those that need to hear it. The third thing that I find that took place for a Merry Christmas, the third thing, are you with me this morning? Are we still okay? The third thing is we need to take time to think it through. Take time to meditate on what Christmas is all about. You know what will happen if we don't? We'll get caught up in the attitude of the world. We get caught up in the, in, in the festivities of the world. We get caught up in commercialism. Take time. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, and all they that heard wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. All them that heard, they meditate. They wondered. They thought about it. They gave thought to what was going on. And more they thought about it, the more exciting it became. Christmas ought to be exciting. We need to gather here on Christmas Eve and for a candlelight service, and that's going to be our midweek service, by the way. It's going to be on Tuesday night instead of Thursday night. But you know what? I know there's a time when a lot of people are doing all their last-minute things, but take an hour and come and come into his presence and let's enjoy the Lord together and let the anointing of God fill us, and then when we leave, we'll be full of his presence and his anointing. Take time to think it through. 
The commercialism of Christmas is not, in fact, buying gifts and decorating buildings and trees. I think we all like that. That's okay. That's not what we're saying. Some people can, how many of you know if we're not careful, we can get off balance either way. Some people, because commercialism has sort of taken over, they won't do anything. They won't, they won't do anything to recognize Christmas. Let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with bringing joy in. There's nothing wrong with gifts. There's nothing wrong with making sure that you, that you have a good time. The commercialism of Christianity is, is when we lose, by our hustle and bustle, we lose focus of the real meaning of Christmas. And when we do that, then we've lost out on what God has for us. Never forget that Jesus came into the world for you and for me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The message was plain to those shepherds that night and it struck wonder in their heart. They were amazed. They were awestruck. When they heard that the Christ child was born, that they were shepherds. If you know anything about shepherds, if you studied anything about shepherds, shepherds were outcast by the normal people. Shepherds smelt bad. Shepherds were out in the field most of the time taking care and tending to their sheep. Uh, they didn't look, weren't dressed very nice. They were, uh, they were country people. They was out in the fields. Uh, they didn't have the best reputation in the world. And these shepherds, when they got the word from the Lord, when they got the anointing that fell and they knew what was going on, uh, they meditated, they thought about it, and they set things aside to make it number one for the moment. Taking time to read the story, that's the reason why I use the honor candlelight. We'll read the Christmas story. Do I got to hear it again, Pastor? Yes. Revelation will come when you hear it again. The anointing will fall when you hear it again. Do I have to sing Christmas songs again at Christmas time? Yes. It speaks the very message of the king. It speaks the very message of our birth of our Lord Jesus and God's love for us that loved us so much that he gave the ultimate sacrifice. Are you with me? What's wrong with taking time and getting a cup of hot tea or a cup of coffee or or your favorite hot cider and, 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 and a cookie and sitting down and relaxing and enjoying as you meditate on the wonders of the story of Christmas. Focusing and listening to the words uh, that we can recognize the great gift that was given to us and meditate on that greatness. And say, Lord, thank you again. Thank you again for the presence and for the anointing for the love you have for me. Then if we're going to say this is a Merry Christmas, the fourth thing, number one, we need to have, make the main thing the main thing. Second, we need to get someone else to help us celebrate. Is anybody with me? That's the reason why we need to come to church. That's the reason on Sunday morning this place should be packed out. We're going to celebrate, and we're going to be celebrating the Christmas story, uh, the coming of our Lord Jesus, the, uh, the, uh, the virgin birth, uh, the uh, love of God shed abroad in, uh, in our hearts and to the world. We're going to celebrate that next Sunday morning. You don't want to do that by yourself. You want to celebrate it with people of like faith and like anointing and his cares and has the same heart. Of course, the third thing, Take time to think it through. Take time to meditate on what God does. Take time to give focus. Don't let it be another fast passing thing as buying gifts and, 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 and hustle bustle of all the things to get through another Christmas. I just can't wait till I get through. Stop and take a moment. Meditate. Think about the things of God. The fourth thing, if you're going to have a Merry Christmas, don't throw anything away. I said, don't throw anything away when it comes to your spiritual life. When it comes to the anointing of God, don't throw anything away. You know what takes place a lot of times at Christmas time? It's happened to me. Family's all gathered, and everybody's got packages, and everybody's, and all the little kids are unpacking stuff, and they're bringing gifts for all stuff. And when you got a family like us, 30 and 35 people, and, everybody, and everybody's opening up packages, and you got a couple of trash bags, and you're putting all the trash in there, and everything's done, Gary, and you go on down, and, and, and you, you've set some stuff aside because you don't have time to fool with it right then. All the family's there. And so after the family's all gone, you get that special little gift, but there's something missing. 
because maybe you threw it away in the hustle and bustle of all the, all the packages. And you're trying to figure out how do I take this thing that needs another part? Or you put something together and you didn't read the directions. Has anybody ever done that? And what happens is it's almost right. How many of you know almost right doesn't count? Only in hangar days and atomic bombs and horseshoes, yeah. How many of you know almost isn't good enough when it comes to understanding and being focused on the things of God? Don't throw anything away. It says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She kept them. Somebody say kept. That means she hung on to them. And that means she kept them in her heart. The spiritual things that are so important in our life, don't throw them away. We're living in a society where they want to throw the important things away. I heard, them, I heard a, 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 a Christmas special the other day, and they made it real significant to make sure that they didn't say Christmas, they said holiday. You know why? They want to throw away the Christmas aspect. They don't want Jesus to be the center of attraction. They want it to be a holiday. Let me tell you something. If we start throwing things like that away, pretty soon we're not going to have anything left. We must hang on to the values that God has given us and the anointing of God. Amen? We need to understand. First, we understand kept. It meant that she remembered the events that night that took place. She focused on that I believe Mary had this in her heart in such a way when she gave birth to Jesus it was unforgettable and I think 33 years later when she stood at the foot of the cross and she saw her son that she gave birth to anybody with me she saw her son that she gave birth to dying on the cross for the sins of the world she remembered what he came into the world for and that was to die but she still was mom she still had the mother's heart. She still wept and broke inside to see her own son hanging on the cross. And he never sinned and he never did anything to deserve it, but he did it for the sins of the world. Mom, Mary mom stood there and saw her son die for the world and for the sins of the world that was heaped upon her. And she kept those things, the memory of him being born, the memory of, uh, of, the, uh, of the gifts that were given, the memory of the occasion that took place. Uh, it, when, she, when she heard the voice of the angel that spoke to her, she kept those memories in her heart, and I think it helped see her through. You and I must keep the things in our heart that count about Christmas and about the Word of God. She meditated on these things. Every detail that surrounded Christmas. Secondly, she kept. Here can also be significant to observe and celebrate the things that's important. Celebrate this time of the year. Celebrate it in your heart. Celebrate what the Word of God says. Celebrate what God's done for you and for me. Then the fifth thing in closing. If we're going to have a Merry Christmas, anybody with me so far? If you're, going to have a, if you're going to have a Merry Christmas, then don't stop until the job's done. Don't stop short until the job, job, job's done. How, how many of you believe those angels? It says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 20, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. The shepherds, do you think they stopped being shepherds because Jesus was born? You think they stopped and got so excited and so ingrained in this, in this new thing that took place that they said, well, we're not going to be shepherds. We're just going to be meditators. And we're just going to sit around and pray. No, they still had to go back to their job because the job wasn't done what God has called them to do. Christmas doesn't derail us from what we're doing. It should encourage us to continue to press on. Merry Christmas just begins in December, and it should continue for the whole year. Christmas ought to be something that every year in, in January and, 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 and February and March and April, May, Christmas ought to still be in our heart because Jesus came for you and for me that we might be redeemed of everything that goes on in our life. The shepherds return to their job and their responsibilities, but you know what I think happened? I think they had a different attitude. 
How many of you will agree with me when you have an encounter with God, your, your attitude changes forever? How many of you will agree with me when you got born again, when you gave your life to Jesus, you, never be, you, never, you, you, you was never the same like you were before? Amen? You're a new creation. You're a brand new man. Old things have passed away. All things became new. They may have gone back to their same old job. They may have gone back to doing the same things that they did before, but something took place with inside of them that changed them from the inside out. And they never forgot what took place on Christmas. Let Christmas be an incredible time this year. Grab onto these five steps to have a Merry Christmas. Let the anointing of God flow through us in a special way. When you see somebody along the street, get excited and wish them a Merry Christmas in Jesus' name. When you know somebody that doesn't have as much as you have, do something to bless them with a Merry Christmas because Jesus paid the price for you. Take time to allow your heart to be, to be expressive and exciting about what took place 2,000 years ago when Jesus came into the world for you and for me. Anybody get anything out of this this morning? Hallelujah. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. Nobody looking around. I'd like to believe everybody in this house is born again. Our brother Mark, you've, about everybody knows Mark. What a wonderful, wonderful brother Mark Hunt was to me. During Mark's sickness, the whole time Mark had the hope of glory. He knew to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. And I would talk to Mark. He was, had the blessed assurance that he had a home in heaven. His name was written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he would pass from this life into eternity to reign with Jesus. You see, that's called the hope of glory. What about you this morning? Do you know? Pastor, we can't know. Nobody can know we're going to heaven. Jesus said you can. He said, these things I've written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. You know, the greatest gift your family could have if you don't know Jesus is you to give your heart to the Lord. That's the greatest gift. The greatest gift you can give your family is to be born again and know Jesus in your heart. If you don't know him this morning, I implore you, I beg of you, let this pastor have the privilege of leading into Jesus and praying you into the kingdom. And you can say this Christmas is the best Christmas I've ever had. Maybe you're here this morning and you used to serve God. You used to be excited about the things of God when someone mentioned the kingdom and mentioned Jesus. Man, you just, you just got excited. There was something in you, but times have passed and the cares of the world have pressed in hurts and you've kind of lost that luster and lost that joy it happened to David sin got in his life and it took away the excitement of God until Psalms 51 when he cried out and says oh God create in me a clean heart restore within me the joy of my salvation take not take not your Holy Spirit from me if you're here this morning and you need and you need to give your heart to the Lord. You need to make sure your name's written in the book of life and you know you've got a home in heaven. Or you found yourself away from the victory and the anointing of God and he's calling you home. Saying, come home, my child. This pastor would be honored to pray for you this morning. If that's you and you meet either one of those categories and you would give me the privilege to pray for you, would you raise your hand right now and say, pastor, that's me. Pray for me. I want to get things right this morning. I want to be where God wants me to be. I'm not sure. Is there somebody by the uplifted hand? Is there one? God bless you, dear. I see that hand. Is there somebody else? Say, me too. Say, me too, Pastor. If you're going to pray for her, pray for me. Somebody else, and you're not sure where you are with the Lord, but raise your hand so we can get sure we can be, get it right right now. It's the greatest time of the year, Christmas season. People's hearts are ready. Is there anybody else by the uplifted hand? Stand with me, if you will, please, everybody in the house. Would the elders come to the altar?
Let this season have an impact in your life. Where's Esmond at? My sister that raised your hand, would you come please and just come down here and let my brothers and sister pray with you. God bless you, sweetheart. God's going to do a fresh work in you right now. Hallelujah. Bless her, Lord. Bless her. Bless her, Jesus. Pray through with her. Pray through with her. Pray through with her. I hope you've been reminded what a Merry Christmas really is this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. If you need prayer, if you need a healing in your body, if you need a touch from the Lord, maybe let me say this. I really feel burdened right now that there's some people here that only one person raised their hand, so I'm believing that every person here is, is saved, you're ready for heaven, and you're a child of God. How many of you right here, there's a family member, there's a loved one, there's someone in your life that you know that you're heavy about, that, you, that, that you're not sure about their relationship with God, and you would love it if, if the Lord would touch them and, and bring them to the kingdom at Christmas time. How many of you? And those of you that got your hands up, I'm going to ask you to come down to this altar because we're going to agree with you. We're going to pray together. We're going to get a breakthrough for those family members. Why? Because this is the time their hearts are going to be softened. And you come. If you need other, if you need prayer for anything else, elders are waiting on the side. But I want you to come fill this front right here. And I want you to come with their name on your heart, okay? I want you to come with their name. If you don't know their name, God knows who they are. You get a visual of who they are. But you know there's somebody that needs to give their heart to the Lord. I want you to come. Just gather around this old-fashioned altar. Move in kind of close right down here in the front. Move in there. Thank you. You know somebody that needs Jesus. What a great time to pray for him right now. You have Can we sing this? His name is called Sing it one more time and then we'll pray. Emmanuel. Lift your voices like a mighty choir just for a moment. Emmanuel. His name is called Emmanuel. Let's pray together. As I come in agreement with you, here's a, there's several different things that connect with prayer. First of all, is power of agreement. Where two or three shall agree, touching any one thing, it shall be done. So I want you to call their name out because I'm going to come in agreement with you. Amen. Where two or three shall agree. Then the scripture says what is bound in earth is bound in heaven. What is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. We're going to pray and ask God to dispatch angels in your behalf of your loved one. And send angels to minister to those that are bound right now because they don't know Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. I want you to reach out and I want you to talk to God right now. I want you to reach out. I want you to claim their name. Speak it out loud. There should be a rumble going on in here. There should be a little bit of noise happening. You call them out to God.
Father, I pray right now for every person that's seeking you, that's praying. Lord, one of the things that's closest to your heart is a soul to be saved, a life to be changed. Lord, in Jesus' name, I claim victory over these names that are being lifted up to you. I ask you, O God, to dispatch angels in behalf of their cry. And Lord, at this Christmas season will be a harvest of souls. It'll be the time you save sons and daughters, that you save, bring husbands into the kingdom. It's a time, Lord God, that wives will repent, cry out to you. It's a time that family members will get close together because they've fallen in love afresh with you. Lord, it's a time that you bring home the backslider in Jesus' name. It's time, Lord God, that you bring in the anointing and through the power of the Holy Spirit and those that have been in rebellion against you. Bring them home. Bring them home. Bring them home in Jesus' name. Christmas season. We want to have a merry Christmas this year. The lives will be changed. The souls will be touched. Lord, in Jesus' name, we commit these loved ones and friends and people that's on our heart, we commit them to you right now. Your word says that, Lord, we call unto me and I will answer thee and I'll show you great and mighty things. We know you're going to answer these prayers because your word is true. You promised that you would. You told us you'd answer. So on behalf of these needs right now, Lord, we call in the harvest. We call in the harvest. The field is white. Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest because the fields white in the harvest, but the laborers are few. Lord, we call in our sons and daughters, our loved ones, our friends, the ones that we have burdens for. Maybe even moms and dads, our children, bring them to you, Lord. Send somebody. Send a harvester to them to bring them home. Lord, we'll give you praise. We'll give you honor and glory. I want you to say with me, I consider it done. Say, so be it. Say, God is a good God. And he's going to answer my prayer. Would somebody give him a big praise? Someone magnify the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Merry Christmas. Turn around and hug somebody and tell them they're special and you're dismissed.